The following program is made possible by the faithful friends and supporters of Higher Aim. Well, welcome. I'm so glad that you have tuned us in today because today we're going to deal with a very important question that every believer needs to be able to be very articulate about, and that is this question. Do all roads lead to heaven? We are living in a culture that believes they do. Today, you're going to find out something a little different. Stay tuned. Let me tell you that heaven is a, a real place. According to Revelation chapter 21, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. The new Jerusalem, that's just the capital city of heaven. Prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So here's the deal. Heaven is where God is. And that's important for us to grab hold of. Now, in the midst of that, let, let me give you a couple of things. First of all, there is a heaven. The Bible teaches that there is a heaven. The Bible teaches there is a hell. There is a heaven. It's interesting. There was a, a poll taken in America years ago, and 94% of the people who were polled said they believed in God. 94%, but you've got to ask, what God? Uh, however, of that same group, only 77% believed in heaven. And then you've got to ask, which heaven? You see, there's all kinds of different philosophical and religious views that, that almost describe serving a different God that are highly uh, believable by many and embraced by thousands upon thousands. In fact, uh, in Proverbs 14, 12, the Bible says, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. And all of those philosophies, all of those religions will lead to death. And many of us, we have a tendency just to want to believe what we want to believe. And that's what the Bible says about that. You can believe what you want, but in the end, it's going to lead to death. And God wants us to come to the place to where we move away from man-made philosophies and understand what he says about heaven. I'm going to give you seven things that the Bible says about heaven. You ready? I'm going to give them to you fast. Number one, it is a place where God dwells. Heaven is where God dwells. Look at this passage, 1 Kings chapter 8. Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. So heaven is a place where God inhabits. He occupies heaven. The Bible also says heaven is the city of God. There in Hebrews 12, the Bible says this. Look at this verse. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. Now, if you want to know more about the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, Revelation 21 is a great place for you to put a footnote in your Bible to go back and read and read and read and read and read it again. It's going to blow your mind because it is a descriptive work of this new Jerusalem, the new capital city of heaven. In fact, let me just tell you a couple of things about it. It is so uh, out there that uh, these words are uh, very powerful that it's difficult for us to even conceive uh, of what it actually says. In fact, it describes this new Jerusalem as roughly 1,400 miles cubed it's as wide and tall as it is high. I did some extrapolation and found out that means that there is 1,960, hear that? 1,960 square miles just on the first floor. Just on the first floor. You take it up and you realize that that gives you the capability of 872,289 possible floors in heaven. Whoa! Man, I'm looking forward to riding that elevator. 
You know it's going to be a glass one so you can see it all. That's an amazing thing. The Bible says it's the city of God. Third, it is where Christ is in God's presence. Look at this verse in Hebrews 9, verse 24. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. In fact, the Bible tells us that Christ ever liveth to make intercession for us. He's praying for you right now. You go, well, that's where Jesus is. Heaven is where Jesus is. It's where he is in God's presence. Now, stop for a second. When you start talking about God's presence, when you start talking about Jesus being in heaven and and, and God on the throne, uh, it's, it, uh, again, it begins to shatter our ability to understand it because Jesus is very God of very God and very man of very man. There are a lot of people who have this mentality that God the Father is on the throne. There's a little chair to his right, which is Jesus. He's sitting in a small uh, seat for baby Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit's kind of like a dove kind of floating around over the top of that throne. Let me just tell you something. You look at Scripture and you allow Scripture to speak. You understand that the Bible says, as John said, I saw a lamb seated on the throne. You know who Jesus is? He's God. He's God the Father. He's God the Son. He's God the Holy Spirit. You go, I don't get that. Uh, Welcome to the limits of the human mind. And that's exactly what the truth is. And you and I need to understand that he's God. He's way outside of our ability. And the problem is religion tries to cut God down and create a system whereby we can understand it and we can work our way to conceive it and make sense of it. God wants us to come to him and respond to him in his person, and he wants us to respond to him through Christ. Well, the Bible also describes heaven as a dwelling place for angels. Now, we're going to talk more about angels in the days to come, but I want you to see this there out of the Scripture. Here's what the Bible says. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, there are different classes of angels, and that they are a spiritual being that God has created to praise Him, to honor Him, to serve Him, and to assist the saints. They minister unto the saints, and the Bible tells us that angels do exist, and we'll talk about them later on. But heaven, that's where they exist. That's where they move and breathe and serve the Lord. Heaven is also the eternal home for believers. Look at this, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. We've already alluded to this. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Here's the deal. This planet is not your home. This is not your forever home. Many of us, we live like this is the only place that there's ever going to be. Your life has been given to you to glorify God for as long as you are on this planet. Everything he has given you, he wants you to use for his glory. Everything you are, he wants you to use for his glory. And the Bible tells us literally that your eternal home, where you will, as a child of God, always exist, is in heaven. I I think one day we're going to look back on this existence on this earthly planet when we're in heaven and go, why were we so puckered up? Why did we live so encumbered by the things of this world and the desires of this world rather than living for Christ? You have one life to live for God, but your ultimate home as a child of God is in heaven and not on this planet, so therefore don't live and love this world and its system like this is forever. You're not going to stay here forever. And all you have to do is look around and realize you got some friends that are not here any longer. You got some family members that are not here any longer. And guess what? Your number may be up next. And it's critical for you to understand that you need to prepare for the next life in this life because this is the only life you're going to have until you raise your eyes in death and meet Christ face to face. Not only is it the eternal home of the believer, but it is a place of perfect peace. Talk about not being able to get your mind around that. Many of us, we have no idea what perfect peace is about. 
Many of us wrestle nonstop. Many of you have a difficult time sleeping because your mind will never shut off. You're always worried about this, always worried about that. There seems to be no peace. Here's what the Scripture says concerning this about heaven. In Revelation 21, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Let me ask you a question. Have you cried over anything, anyone, any relationship, any situation this last week? There will be no need for tear ducts in heaven. Isn't that great? In fact, there will be no more death. Some of you have lost loved ones this week. Some of you have lost relationships. Some of you are just broken because of separation. That's what death is. There's no more separation, no more mourning. There's no more grief. There's no more cathargic emotion that just rips the heart out of you any longer in heaven. There's no more crying, no more crying. And guess what? No more pain. Many of you are dealing with pain right now. Some of you have pain in your back, pain in your side, pain in your head, pain in your heart. Maybe you're living with Mrs. Pain or Mr. Pain. But regardless, there is no more pain. By the way, there's no marriage in heaven. You realize that? There's no marriage in heaven. There's no giving and taking uh, in that relationship in heaven. Man, we're all going to be children of God, and our focus is going to be upon the Lord and celebrating what God has given us. And that's an exciting thing. Here's the deal, because the old order of things have, has passed away. You know what heaven is? It's where God pushes the reset button. He pushes the reset button. New order. New order on all things, all the rules that you operate your life on, all the rules of science that science has grasped hold of, reset button. That's what heaven is like. The old order has passed away. And you and I need to understand there's another word of description for this, and that is it's totally indescribable. Heaven is totally indescribable. You think about the gates of pearl that we've talked about, streets of gold, the magnificent foundations as you read in Revelation 21. No wonder Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, watch this, no, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived, what God has pre prepared for those who love him. In other words, you cannot get your mind around, you cannot even imagine what heaven is going to be like for you who know Christ. I, I don't know about you, but I, I love this planet. This planet is beautiful beyond description. I love the Rocky Mountains, mountain streams, the uh, uh, the, even the deserts have a beauty all of their own, the, the oceans, the beaches, and I, uh, even the, the, the flatlands have a, 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 a wild beauty about them. And you look at that and you realize that God created this planet in six days, spoke it into existence, six days. Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you so that, that I'll come back and take you to be with me so that you can be with me. He said, I'm going to prepare a mansion, and in my Father's house are many rooms. Let me just tell you this. If God created this world in six days, and he did, and it's gorgeous, and it is, think what heaven's like, and he's been working on it for over 2,000 years. Whoa, 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 whoa. No wonder Paul says you can't get your mind around it. It is totally indescribable. So that's my first point. I'm now ready to give you my second point. You ready? Here it is. Heaven, there's a way to get there. Now, you say, okay, there's a way to get there. There are a lot of religions. Are there? Are there really a lot of religions? A lot of different philosophies, a lot of different religions. Dr. W, or excuse me, Dr. H.A. Ironside said it like this. Listen to this. He said, it all comes down to two religions. There are those that you go to heaven based on something that you do, or there is Christianity that says you go to heaven based upon something that has already been done for you. 
You see, you can either say it's about my performance that's going to get me into heaven. There are a lot of people who believe that. Be a good person, do the right thing, you're going to go to heaven. Well, what do you do about all the bad things you've ever done? In fact, if you took your good works and your bad works and you weighed them together, your bad works would outweigh your good works. But what would you do with the one bad thing that you've done, the one sin? How do you get rid of that? In fact, the Bible says in Revelation 21, verse 8, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Let me ask you a question. You ever been a coward? You ever not stood for Christ? Have you ever had an unbelieving moment in your life? Have you ever been vile? That means just totally despicable, ungodly thoughts, ungodly actions. Have you ever been a murderer, not necessarily taking someone's life? The Bible says even if you look at someone with anger in your heart, you're guilty of that. Whoa, the sexually immoral, going, ah, man, I'm faithful to my wife. You know what Jesus said? You looked at a woman with adultery, with lust in your mind, you're, you've already, you're already guilty of adultery. Whoa. Ah, huh. those who practice magic arts, that's the occult. That's trying to create situations that you get your way and things where you can just make your things happen to have what you want. Idolaters, that's where you have something that is more important to you than God himself, whether it's your money, your career, your position, even your health becomes, some of us, an idol. And all liars, you ever told a lie? Have you? You go, no, no, you're a liar. You're right there. Their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. It's the second death. In other words, you physically die, you're going to spiritually die. But that death keeps going on for all eternity. You go, I don't like, I don't want to believe a God, that there is a God that is so uh, vengeful that he would send someone to hell. I don't believe in that kind of God. You go on saying that. You just go ahead and believe that. You, it doesn't make any difference what you believe. You can believe that this sweater is purple. It's blue. That's blue. You go, no, I believe it's purple. You are totally wrong if you think this is purple or your television set is messed up. The problem is many of us, we have our television sets spiritually messed up, and we want to believe what we want to believe rather than what God says. And God says, nobody like this is going to go into my heaven. You blow it one area, you're not going to heaven. You know why? Because a holy God will not have fellowship with sin in his presence. And the only way that you can be made holy is to come to Christ, and that's very, very important. That's why I need to tell you what Jesus said, and this is a very exclusive statement, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You hear that? Jesus is the only way. Don't think baptism, don't think communion, don't think denominationalism here. It's only through Christ. You can't get to the Father. You can't get to heaven unless you come to Jesus. You know why? Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Don't think you're going to get around Jesus so that you can get to God a different way. Jesus is God. You know when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? When he says, I am the good shepherd, where I am the light of the world, where I am the resurrection and the life, where I am the bread of life? You know what phrase he was using? The Greek word, Greek phrase, that go I me. It literally meant I am that I am. That's the Old Testament description of God telling Moses to tell Pharaoh what his name is. I am that I am. And that's why they accused him of blasphemy, because he called himself co-equal. And quite frankly, he said, I am God. You remember when the disciples said, Jesus, if you just show us the Father, That'll be enough for us. And he looked at them and said, have I been with you that long and you don't know who I am? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Whoa! What I'm trying to tell you, 
Jesus is God, and you can't get to God thinking that you can get around Jesus. He is the only way to know God because he is God, and that's what the Bible says. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7 these words, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. That narrow road, that small gate, is the Jesus road, the Jesus interstate, the Jesus gate. And the only way that you can go to heaven is to come to Christ. The only way you can go to heaven is to come to Christ. And so that is very important. Without Christ, no one goes to heaven. No one goes to heaven without coming to Christ. That's what the Bible says. But let me give you one last word, and that is simply this. There is the possibility of going there. God wants you to know right now in your life on this side of eternity that you will go to heaven. That's important. Do you know that there was a survey done that uh, people were asked, do they think that they have the possibility to go to heaven? And 76% of the people who were uh, polled said, I think I have a really good or excellent possibility of going to heaven. And of those same people, only 6% said there's a, a good possibility of me going to hell. Everybody thinks I am going to heaven. But there are people who literally have never given their life to Christ, who think that that God was just kidding when he allowed his son to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. The only way to have eternal life is to come to Christ. I spent my entire life trying to point people to Jesus. My entire ministry has been to point people to Christ. Let me tell you something. You and I prepare for the next life right now right now. And God wants you to know that you know, that you know him. This last week, I had a call uh, from one of the men in our church who wanted me to visit his mom who's in the last stages of her life. He was concerned about her spiritually. And I went to the hospital room, 94 years old, 94, mind sharp as a tack. And I sat down with her as just the two of us and I shared the gospel with her and I asked her, as I called her by name, has there ever been a moment in your life where you turned for sin, from sin and placed your faith in Christ? Maybe you've believed about God and loved God and loved Jesus, but have you ever given your life to Christ and ever turned from your sin and committed everything you are to Christ? She looked at me and she said, nope, I don't believe I have. I said, would you like to? She said, oh, yes, yes. And so I had the privilege of praying with this 94-year-old woman to give her life to Christ. Now, let me tell you something. You may not have to 94 to give your life to Christ. In fact, you may not live that long. And if you do, who's to say you're still going to have the wits about you at 94 where you can think logically and coherently enough to understand the question? You and I are given today and today only. And if you have never turned from sin and placed your faith in Christ, I pray that today would be that day, that this moment would be that moment where you would be willing to say, Jesus, I need you. I'm not going to trust religion. I'm not going to trust philosophy. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to turn from my sin, and I'm going to place all of my faith in you, Jesus, and your finished work for me on the cross. Is that where you are today? Maybe you're here, and you've been listening to this sermon and God just spoken to you and said, you've known a lot about me, but you don't really know me. In fact, that's the job of the Holy Spirit to reveal to you whether you are a child of God or not. You can't talk yourself in to thinking that you're a child of God when you're not. You can't talk yourself out thinking that you're not a child of God. You don't need any self-talk because the Holy Spirit's doing the talking right now inside your heart. So where are you right now? In just a moment, Dr. Dodd will return with a closing thought. During the month of June, we salute dads. It's their job to lead, provide, and love their families. Sometimes the job can be a little overwhelming, so we'd like to help. 
We've created a special card with examples of great dads from the Bible. You can use it for a bookmark or just keep it handy for a great reference. It's our hope that all dads will choose to be like these men. To receive your free card with examples of the dad you've always wanted to be, call or go online today. Thank you for being with us today. And I pray that today's message really hit home with you. And I need to ask you a question. You who have been watching so faithfully, has there come a one-time experience in your life where you have turned from your sin and placed your faith in Jesus? Have you done that? Don't put in the denominational thing. Don't say, I've gone to church all my life or I've always believed. The real truth is, you cannot get saved until you first realize that you are lost, that you're separate from God because of sin. And if you will invite Christ to come inside your life, he will change you from the inside out. If you have never made that commitment, I pray that today would be the day that you pray to receive Christ. Allow me to lead you in a, in a small prayer that you can make your own right now and invite Christ to take charge of your life. You do this and you become a Christian. You do this and you can be assured of going to heaven when you die. You do this and you can be assured that God will give you peace, his presence in your present from here on out. You wanna do that? Why don't you make this your prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, just breathe that to him after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I admit to you that I am a sinner. I need you. I need you to forgive me of all my sin. Cleanse me and make me whole and clean. Jesus, thank you for dying for me on the cross and coming alive again from the grave. I want you to be my Lord, my boss. And so as best as I know how, I invite you to come inside my life and be my Lord, be my Savior. I give you all that I am. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you pray that? Did you mean that? Well, if you did, you can know because Romans 10, 13 says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you let us know that you did that? Call us right now. Call one of our folks that are waiting to hear from you. In fact, we have some wonderful resources we'd love to provide you to help you grow in your faith. And honestly, if we can pray for you about anything, let us know. Would you call us? God bless you for connecting today. Thank you for joining us on Higher Aim. Have you been encouraged by what you've heard today? We would love to hear from you. Call 1-800-491-4400. Visit us at higheraim.org or write to us at Higher Aim, Post Office Box 8100, Omaha, Nebraska 68108. Thank you again for joining us. See you next time on Higher Aim. The preceding program was brought to you by the faithful supporters of Higher Aim.